Turquoise really has only one commercial application, and that's in jewelry. And we often see fine turquoise in Native American jewelry. Now, one question I always get is, what's the turquoise in this jewelry? And first of all, I'm not an expert in Native American jewelry, and I'm not really an expert in turquoise identification. It takes decades of seeing lots and lots of turquoise before you can start to, to get good at turquoise identification. And even then, those who really uh, are the most knowledgeable are often the least likely to give an opinion because it's very difficult. Um, but one thing I will refer you to is uh, this book, because we're going to be looking today about turquoise identification in bolo ties. And this is an excellent book uh, by Diana Pard Pardue with Norman Sanfield. And it's uh, Native American Bolo Ties. And I'd really recommend this book because it really gives you a wonderful background about the bolo tie. So with that, we can still look at some characteristics in bolo ties to try to get some help in determining what's the most probable turquoise that could be in that bolo tie. And, uh, you know, the first characteristic is the age. When was the bolo made? And in our first photo, we're going to see moving from left to right, a very early bolo tie from the 50s. And this looks to me like it has Bisbee turquoise. This would have been very early period when Bisbee was producing turquoise when they first opened up the lavender pit in the early 50s. And I know the date of this because it belonged to my father. And I know when he was in the Southwest and when he would have been uh, buying this bolo tie. The next one we have as we move across is a, is a Zuni bolo of Rainbow Man made by Alonzo Hustace. And I'm going to say this is most probably blue gem turquoise, largely because of the involvement of C.G. Wallace in providing turquoise to the Zuni, especially during this period. And uh, you can get a lot of background on that in Turquoise in America Part 2, where I think we really demonstrate the connection of C.G. Wallace, Zuni, jewelry, and the blue gem mine. Uh, moving over, uh, again, we see one by Frank Patania. Now, I'm going to say this is probably from the 60s, uh, late 50s, early 60s, and it's number eight turquoise. Once again, we know the connection of uh, Frank Patania Sr. Uh, sourcing lots of turquoise, uh, a lot of Godber Burnham, and other turquoise that he was um, sourcing from the Godber family directly. So again, real good providence on this, and this is really pretty clearly number eight turquoise. Uh, finally, the last one we see is a beautiful little bolo by Chester Kahn. Again, probably late 60s, 70s, and uh, once again, uh, most probable that it is blue gem turquoise. In the next photo, we're gonna turn these over because oftentimes the, the best way to look at a bolo uh, to determine its age is by looking at the back. Of course, you can also see who possibly made it. Uh, that uh, the back is going to see the type of clasp that it has. And we see the, the first bolo, the earliest one, there is no clasp. It's just the, the pressure of the uh, uh, exerted on the, uh, um, on the cord itself. Then we start moving over and we see the next two and they have loops that are creating the pressure to hold the bolo. Finally, on the Chester Kahn bolo, we see the Bennett clasp. And that one really helps to identify uh, the age because the Bennett clasp was a patented clasp and uh, really existed for a long time because uh, while it was patented, I believe in the 1950s, would have been the earliest period of that, um, there was so much on stock that we see this continuing on for many, many years, the use of this clasp. The next thing we look at is the length and thickness of the cord. The early bolos were very short and they had a very thin uh, cord, leather cord that, that uh, they would have used. As we start proceeding on in time, as we're gonna see, the cord gets thicker and thicker and longer and longer. The next, photo we see is going to show a little bit about the tips. We're going to see some example of a later period 
where we see the tips going from being very light in the early period, and often they were stock tips that the artists would just buy these tips. And they were very light and um, just easy to source. As we see the later period, uh, we start seeing much more of these handmade tips, and they become much more of a integral part of the design of the bolo. Uh, we see in this a photo, we see a beautiful uh, big bolo by Vernon Haskey with a dark web Kingman, and also one by Ron Bodoni uh, using some fine Bisbee turquoise. We see how the tips get much heavier, especially on the, the Vernon Haskey piece, really, really heavy. Uh, we see the cord has gotten very thick here and uh, very, very intricate in the whole design of the bolo itself. Um, next photo, we're going to look at the clasp on the Vernon Haskey bolo, and we see there that they're kind of reverting back to a loop pressure clasp. So we will see that not only on a lot of the older bolos, but also on the newer pieces. Um, Finally, we're going to see a series of photos here that are by Arlen Ben, and you can see those in the photo gallery in Turquoise in America Part 2. Uh, we're going to see my very favorite bolo ever, which is the bolo I got from my dad, and uh, it's from the 50s. We see that uh, picture there. Then we're going on and we'll see the uh, uh, example of a uh, blue gem in the uh, Zuni piece by uh, Alonzo Justes. Um, finally, we have uh, two examples of Lone Mountain. One is kind of that lighter look for Mo Lone Mountain, still a beautiful webbed look, um, kind of a lighter web. And uh, this is by Preston Monongi. So I know this is probably coming in the, in the mid to late 70s. And then finally, we see a beautiful Julian Lovato bolo where he's using five calibrated uh, dark web uh, Lone Mountain cabochons. So I hope this has given you a little idea about how we can match the age of the bolo with what turquoise would have really been available to those artists at that time. And therefore we can sort of get an idea of what would be the most probable source uh, our identification of that turquoise. So I hope you've enjoyed this, this little video about turquoise in bolos.